Okay, let's get started. Thank you. It has been a great session so far and uh, truly enjoyed the presentation by Larry. And thank you all for coming to join this uh, uh, session. I know I had a lot of competitions, have a lot of choice. So we really appreciate you show up in this room. Um, so uh, self-introduction, I'm Wen Yuan Shi. Uh, I was a professor at UCLA School of Dentistry and Medicine for 23 years. And five years ago, I moved across the country and uh, joined the Forsyth Institute. And for the people outside the dentistry, if you're wondering what the Forsyth is, where an institute founded in 1910, um, we are Boston based and have been a Harvard affiliated research institute and uh, doing a cutting edge dental oral health research, as well as uh, focus quite a bit on community service uh, as well. So um, a li little disclosure to get started and uh, uh, back at UCRA and with the West Coast mentality, when you do a good science, the investor knocking at your door. So I get involved in set up a, uh, founded multiple startup companies and uh, including C3 Gen Therapeutics is now a public traded company called Amada Pharmaceutical. Um, after joining the Forsyth, we spent quite a bit of the time and to building the ecosystem to supporting the research involving technology development. Just like today when we talk about data science, those are very exciting technology could disrupt in the dentistry. And so we have the opportunity and to work with uh, all the stakeholders in the ecosystem, whether you're a global dental company, whether you're a, a startup company or whether you're an investment firm, and we work with them very closely. And that is the focus of my today's presentation. So since we're talking about disruptive technology, I wanted to get started. We all know it's the sugar and who have created the dentistry as a profession. And uh, our modern human being takes a lot more refined sugar than our ancestor, and uh, which is totally changing our oral microbiome composition, which leads to a dramatic increase of the tooth decay and other associated disease. And also the discovery of the fluoride has been dramatically reduced uh, the, the tooth decay rate, Forsyth Institute is very proud to be one of those teams contributed to figure out the mechanism of the fluoride protective mechanism. And uh, as you can see, the single in, you know, discovery and have been totally changing the way we're treating the dentistry. And it comes to a University of Michigan, W.D. Miller, and uh, is really the one, you know, through his microbiology and the dentistry connection and uh, understand the plaque, which is containing a carigenic bacteria and who is uh, working with the, uh, the, the, the sugars and uh, who generating the acid that leads to the decay. And it is that discovery founded the modern dentistry and uh, where we try to remove the plaque and we try to control the sugar uptake and uh, we try to repair the damage. And uh, if you look at recently, those are historical disruptive event. And uh, if you look at recently, and uh, it's, uh, you know, Dr. Bramark and uh, when the uh, accidental experiment, the finding titanium had great osteointegration ability and a single discovery and it leads to now a $10 billion a year implant business. And you may or may not heard Invisalign who is really impacting the orthodontic industry and was really set up by a Hollywood computer visual effect specialist. Dr. Charlie Wan is a Caltech, you know, special imaging person and uh, uh, who are responsible for making all those cartoons on Godzilla's uh, or uh, star troops and uh, who have been using the similar technology and to control the tooth movement, which is ultimately leads to the genesis of the Invisala. So it's really today's topic is what are the you know, new uh, 
innovations were disrupting the dentistry. We talk about the data science, and there's so many other things. It's there, and uh, and 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 how we're going to actually create the ecosystem to make it a reality. Now, dentistry is changing, and as we know, we get more and more female students in the dentistry. Even though for a while, some of the dental schools are closing and the, um, reducing uh, its student rate, but now it's booming than ever, and we have more and more new dental schools are popping up. American is also aging, as you can see by 2020s. 35, and we're going to be have more elderly than our youngsters. And, the, and you can see by the moving to the 2024, the proportion of the elderly will be dramatically increased, uh, which means uh, the needs in dentistry will be changing dramatically. Those are the big data that have been guiding us to the right direction. And uh, certainly we also know, and I love that picture of uh, uh, Larry had been showing for a while, you know, the oral cavity and dentistry gets isolated with the medicine, but it is the time to put the mouse back to the body. And uh, the discovery of the oral and the systemic connection had been make a huge difference. So with all this as a background, the dentistry is changing, new technology is coming up and uh, how are we going to be actually supporting the new technology? As you can see, the few of the cases I mentioned in my previous slides, most of the disruptive revolution in dentistry is done by a certain accident and uh, have ne never really have any organized effort. But now we're in a different era. And uh, if you're reading that 2021 uh, NIH report on uh, Oral Health in America, we realize the emerging technology who are disrupting the dentistry have been very much uh, being, you know, all the experts will be agree either on the preventive dentistry and we need to uh, understand that, you know, two stick in periodontal disease as a microbial infection or information disease more. And we need to come up with the right tool to manage the disease. And uh, also, you know, the, the digital dentistry and uh, uh, to creating a fully functional digital process, all the 3D printing CAT CAM is going to be changing the way we practice dentistry. But between those two very important areas, what is connecting them is the data science, which we talk a lot today. And, uh, and this is a, a truly a very exciting area and, uh, and going to changing it. But how to actually making the data to truly serving our daily practice? And how are we making those creative idea and to ultimately become an innovative product to be used at clinic? The death valley is uh, very deep. And uh, if there is a death valley in medicine, at least the last 30 or so years, and so many of the investment firm have been set up. So many of the incubators and accelerator is available to do that. But in dentistry, such a support is very limited. Um, so this death valley has been really uh, deep than ever compared with a lot of other disciplines. And this is where we're talking about the ecosystem. Because uh, in order for anything, to have an organized approach, somebody who not only just need a good idea, a government that not only needed to shout in some slogans, and uh, we it really involving the funding partner and public or private, and uh, it will be really need and more of the IP protections, and it will be really need more of the innovation environment. You know, come from Kendall Square in Cambridge. And that little square miles, you got thousands of companies. And at 2021, they raised $36.9 billion. And why all the investors give all their money to, to those companies only, you know, located within a square miles is because it got the ecosystem. It got 
you know, all the industry partner, you got all the service system, you got all the lab central, you got all the R&D facility. So the people with the good idea and can now finding the funding and tap into the incubators and the accelerators and uh, to actually making their success as a reality. And again, you know, such a system is uh, largely missing in oral health innovation field. And that is something I think, uh, you know, federal government have been trying hard to fill this vacuum and uh, universities and have been trying to do that very hard on that. And uh, Forsyth has been uh, making its own effort doing that as well. And we realize, you know, most of the university only maybe stay on the left part of it. You do research and you may be validating some of your research results through an in vitro or animal model or through some other um, alternative models. But it's much harder and tough to do and to actually pushing through a clinical trial, the regulatory R&D and the product development, because all that require a dedicated team who have a clinical research expertise, know how to interacting with the regulatory agency like FDAs. And you need a startup incubator space so the good idea will be able to raise the fund and the doing the R&D to move the project forward. And you also need the funding to supporting it. And uh, so in the last five years, the FOSA is under my watch and we've been greatly beef up our, you know, clinical research capacity. We clean the incubators and helping our professor who just not only have the idea and the, but also and the creating the company, make it a reality. And our latest move just like some of my sister institute, like MGH, Boston Children Hospital, we're also creating our oral health focused innovation VC fund and allow us to move in those projects forward. And uh, we also finding creating an ecosystem to make that possible is not only starting the training and have the student coming and to train them early and planting the seeds on them, and even your dental student or, or your starting dentist, even though you're passionate about the clinical care, which is very important, but you could also make innovations in the dental field, okay, which is a, it's something really needed in the dentistry. And you could make an even bigger impact, just like the, the, the creation of the Invisalign or implant. Um, and then we were also creating courses like from lab to market and to train the professors and uh, who have the passion for technology development and uh, to move it forward. And the furthermore, we also find in order to creating the ecosystem is particularly important is bring the investors and the inventor together. Since uh, 2021, and uh, we've been uh, creating this dentistry focused investment forum. And we actually have 80% of the, uh, now the global uh, investment firms and the startup company showing up this events and allow them to interact with each other. And we've been helping uh, many of the startup to be funded or getting the vis visibility and for the investment community, know them better. Now there's so many things that we could do. And uh, when it comes to digital health, and the data science. And uh, among them, you know, AI, whether it's an AI-driven treatment plan or AI-driven teledentistry, using AI to uh, more effectively uh, detecting insurance floor. There's so many of the technology could be using and it will be disrupting the future of the dentistry. And we're very proud is actually all of the many companies who showed up uh, uh, in our Dentech presentation, one of our star and, uh, is Overjet. And I'm very excited to have, that, uh, have a Chris be our co-presenter and for the session, give you some actual flavor of how MIT derived the technology company 
be able to raise $80 million and in a very short period of the time, and they're doing some very exciting work can potentially uh, disrupt in the dentistry. So with this, I want to thank you all for listening. And if you wanted to get some more information about this, and uh, feel free to contact me with the email below. And uh, before I'll turn the table to Chris, I'm more than happy to entertain some of the questions you have about the importance of the ecosystem, how you get involved in the ecosystem, and, uh, and how you want to create in the entrepreneurship. Thank you for listening. Any questions, you can use the chat. Oh, Chris, I'll just turn to you to talk about your cool technology and your experience as a dentist in technology innovation, and then we could address some of the questions all together in the end. Sounds great, Dr. Wen. Thank you so much. And, and uh, a lot of information in 15 minutes. I think you practiced yours more than mine. I'm going to try to keep time. Um, but, uh, you know, it as I'm going to share my screen now um, and, and give a little bit of, of a background of where I came from and, and what we're doing as a company, and ultimately how we wouldn't have been here without the help of um, some of these incubator programs that Dr. Wen was speaking to in particular, uh, Harvard's incubator program. And uh, let me just know when you can see my screen, uh, if anyone just wants to give me a thumbs up and we'll get right into it. Perfect. So again, first of all, thank you um, uh, to Kathy and to the entire organization for inviting me to be a part of this breakout session. Um, it's a, a humbling experience to always be able to you know, be on the same stage virtually or, or in person with uh, a lot of the incredible speakers and, and presenters today. Uh, I was asked to take a little bit of a different approach uh, with respect to the um, um, the LHS collaborative or uh, LHC collaborative it is, you know, <laughs> how am I leveraging my dental degree? And, and I know that there's one dental student or new, uh, soon to be dental student on the call, but, you know, is there dentistry outside of wet-handed dentistry? And the answer is absolutely. And, and you don't necessarily understand or know this, at least even when I was in school in, you know, 2012 uh, through 16 at, at Boston University, that there was this whole other world of, of how to leverage your dental degree uh, and how you can collaborate, you know, cross um, discipline um, and, 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 you know, cross functionally in many ways. So uh, a little bit of my presentation today is going to be about sort of my story and it's just starting and our company is just starting. So I don't have an end goal to say, you know, how successful has my entrepreneurial journey been? I think right now it's, um, it's been, you know, a great learning experience and I'm, I'm going to speak to the early parts of that. Uh, and what exactly uh, are we building uh, with with the company that we had started, and how hopefully uh, does that fit into exactly what Dr. One had ended the presentation? You know, as we're having some of these technological paradigm shifts, um, you know, towards digitization, towards automation, um, AI seems to be a you know a big buzzword, and 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 you know interacts with us and with other things um, a lot more than we're aware of right now. And at Overjet, what we've been building out from a dental application uh, to improve uh, oral health care and overall care health care for, uh, for patients is what you're going to be uh, hearing about today. Uh, so my name is a quick conflict of interest. Uh, again, I do have uh, some uh, uh, of a conflict in the sense that, you know, we started the company Overjet, a, a few of us out of Boston, and, uh, and you know, I'm, I actively work for them. So everything you're seeing will be my uh, views that I'm expressing and, and should not reflect, you know, the organization. Uh, and again, I'm not being paid for this discussion today, but I do have a financial interest in uh, the product being or the products being discussed. Uh, in general, though, this should be aspirational and, and I'll, I'll try to keep it that way. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I am a, a clinician by a, a dentist by training. I studied at Boston University and um, my wife and I uh, had a small practice in Boston after we had graduated. And uh, the way that I actually got involved with, um, with call it, you know, technology and, and a startup company was that uh, 
I met a patient of mine who was an MIT PhD scientist uh, who was studying autonomous systems and, and, and AI uh, and, and outside of dentistry, so in medicine. And as Dr. Wen said, that, that Death Valley is, um, is slightly different and, 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 uh, when you compare dental medicine to traditional medicine and, um, or to Western medicine. But we, uh, we were practicing dentistry, her and I, and, and I ended up meeting this patient uh, who had an idea about standardizing and helping improve you know, communication with patients and the quality of care that patients can receive in dentistry by applying some of the technology to the dental data uh, that she was sort of witnessing as she was um, uh, embarking on her own dental journey. Um, so the person in, in question is on the left side there. Her name is Dr. Warda Inam, and she um, had this idea about, you know, could we uh, apply, you know, machine vision technology and, and AI technology to all of this dental data that we are, uh, we basically have at our fingertips, but again, are disconnected and, and um, non-structured and all of these worlds that you hear that AI can help with, taking a lot of unstructured data, putting it into more structured format. So what came of that idea was uh, funding from uh, MIT's incubator arm, and then ultimately uh, being incubated at the Harvard Eye Labs in Alston, Boston, uh, Massachusetts, where it's an incredible space for young um, entrepreneurial-like um, uh, you know, students or, or, or recent graduates to come and uh, have a collaborative um, environment. It's like a big warehouse in some sense, and, and a bunch of young um, kids with a lot of exciting ideas working together and, and obviously not having to um, uh, feel that burden of, uh, of, you know, rent in Boston or, or you know, computers. Uh, like there's a lot of incredible support and mentorship and legal advice. And so we were Harvard, we were incubated out of the, the Harvard iLab in 2018, and it was a group of four of us, um, uh, so two technologists and two dentists. And that's how I started, you know, scratching the surface of um, non-traditional uh, dentistry, uh, because again, I'm still practicing dentistry right now, but in a very different way. I serve as one of the uh, VPs of clinical affairs for Overjet, but, you know, I'm using what I know about dentistry to help uh, impact the lives of many people, where, or at least, you know, we're, we're starting to uh, to see that, that uh, revolution uh, by, you know, employing what I learned at BU and through my mentors and through uh, dental practice and, and how we can actually build a product that, um, you know, is ethical and evidence-based and, and all of these things that, again, we, we adhere to from uh, when we actually treat patients, but we want the technology to, uh, to be in line with those principles. So on the left, that's Ward and I. On the right is a super exciting day. And I wanted to post this here for anyone who's even a dentist, not a dentist, but this was three of our machine learning scientists when we were a group of seven of us. And it was the first time that we learned that a computer could actually identify and count teeth. And that's what you see here on this monitor. And I took this picture and I'm glad I hung on to it because we've come a long way since being able to count teeth. But this was like the first big hurdle that we we crossed. And it was a it was sort of a big milestone for us as a company uh, from a technological standpoint. And I've got, again, the technology can do much more than uh, simply count teeth. And we'll go into that in a little bit. Um, I did want to give credit because I wouldn't be speaking here today and I wouldn't uh, be able to um, to take credit for anything that that we're accomplishing if it wasn't for a lot of people working behind the scenes. And, you know, what started out as a very local company in Boston in 2018 obviously changed when COVID happened in 2020. And, you know, a, a large part of the company, if not all the com uh, company at that time went remote. And what that allowed for us was also to tap into sort of unknown talent. And so anyone who's sort of going through this entrepreneurial journey or, or working um, uh, on, on something um, that could be similar or, or, you know, to what we are doing, um, you know, the Dr. Tabak talked a lot about, you know, working with one another and collaborating and sharing. A lot of that is, those are, those are great things to uh, aspire to, but in reality, sometimes they're more challenging. I think, you know, one positive, uh, Thing that we had taken out of everyone being locked down was we could tap into talent from all over the country, all over the world, essentially. So we've grown from a small company of you know four of us to uh, close to 130 of us now, and this is one page of multiple pages that we screenshot on on Fridays when we have our you know weekend wrap up, and each team presents uh, sort of what they uh, they've worked on in the last uh, uh, little while, and uh, again. It's all about teamwork and collaboration, and I think that was part of the the theme of today's keynote speaker. And I uh, I fully agree that that this is you know how one plus one can be greater than two. That being said, I will spend uh, the next 
um, few uh, minutes in some sense, uh, talking a little bit about what the technology is that we've actually built, what is Overjet doing and how is it important and why is it important and why are, you know, are so many um, people working um, day and day behind the scenes to, to fulfill the dream of improving um, patient lives through artificial intelligence. So we'll talk a little bit about AI. We'll talk a little bit about um, the possibilities, how it's actually used uh, within the clinic, within the academic setting, within other non-traditional settings, uh, and ultimately, how can we use this technology? Uh, and hopefully, I can impart that to today's um, group that joined us to improve patient communication, enhance the patient experience, empower, and make sure that that you know care that needs to be delivered is actually being followed up on uh, because uh, patients understand more about what is happening in their oral cavity. Um, so, you know, in some sense, put yourself in, in the chair of the dentist as we go on this ride right now. So on a high level, this is, you know, this was one of the problems we were trying to solve. I'm putting an x-ray up here and you don't have to be a dentist. To, um, and I'm not asking to diagnose anything, but we're asking questions to say, you know, does this patient have bone loss? Does this patient have cavities? Does this patient have tartar calculus? And, and these are, are images that, you know, dentists take for granted and often, you know, not don't always see things the same way. So if there are more dentists on this call today, you know, some may see something in one area differently than someone else in another area. And a patient sitting there is nodding their head and understanding like, you know, yes, I have cavities and we're pointing to these different shadows and they're trying to understand, you know, why should I treat that? It doesn't hurt. I don't understand that. And we're going to sort of leverage this image a little later on. One of the problems that we had discovered and, and really has been the catalyst for Overjet getting um, some of the, the funding when we initially uh, applied for it was, um, you know, do we have a standardization problem? And I think if the answer to this was no, we would be in a different situation, we'd be in a different field, maybe we wouldn't necessarily need this technology as much as we believe uh, we do, and, and those who are leveraging it now understand they now do. And so this was an image that was submitted when we were trying to find folks to come and help label data, and we'll talk about what that means in, a, in just two slides. But basically, what you see in blue boxes there on this x-ray are five small little cavities, and those were clinically confirmed, and this is our ground truth. And, and when it comes to AI, there's a lot about having a good ground truth, non-biased ground truth well distributed and i think there was you know some discussion in the keynote to say you know how do you have data sets that aren't biased towards one thing or for the other it's a hard problem to solve it's even harder when you have to have humans train those ai models and when we give this image to 75 dentists across the country those who just graduated to those who just um um or those who have just retired and ask them three simple things that in a blue box you know put a uh, put a blue box around a certain a type of decay. For the clinicians on here, I'm looking for primary decay. Put an orange box around secondary decay. I mean, that means cavities that are, you know, around a filling. And then the last question is, would you treat this? And I start all my lectures with this because I think it's a very powerful, powerful uh, visual. We combined 75 of those results into one image. And this is the result of that. So if this is you in that chair right now. When you saw 75 dentists, you would have nearly every single tooth and every single surface treated because the answer to would you treat this, which was our last question, blue box, orange box, would you treat this, was at least yes to every one of those boxes by at least one person. And so that was sort of the 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 catalyst that that allowed us to to, to one, you know, confirm that we were our hypothesis that the industry could use some standardization and that AI, we believed, could help with that um, was based on. Very quickly on a high level, I'll be using terms like machine learning and deep learning. And, and again, uh, AI being this, this overarching umbrella term, but we're operating at the, at the ML and, and that deep learning level. And uh, when we're actually um, focusing on what we're talking about here today and the AI that we're working on, you know, is similar the, the way that these algorithms work to the neurons in the brain. And I'm not going to focus on that, but just a lot of some conceptual visualizations. And what we do is we label a lot of data so that when we put an image into our system, it can give us an output that's similar to an image that a dentist would label. And this is done through millions and millions of data points. And we are taking data from a lot of sources. And I know that Dr. Wen posted a question there that the insurance companies have a lot of data. And the answer is they do. And the way that things get shared and how things get shared and anonymized and protected is also a very challenging thing to navigate. But the idea is when we're training our algorithms, we want as many 
non, you know, or, or distributed um, sources as possible so that our algorithms aren't biased towards, you know, one particular um, population or another or one particular finding and not another. And so what that allows you to do is, you know, um, really pull out extremely interesting artifacts out of these are black and white x-rays that AI is looking at. And, and, on, and from a visual perspective, you can see the AI is pulling out different anatomical landmarks in yellow. And we can begin to combine, you know, different data points and measure certain data points uh, and apply that to evidence-based science to actually help doctors make better decisions for their patients. And so just a couple slides, I know that we only have a couple minutes left is, you know, we can count teeth. I talked about that, but we can also number teeth and then we can measure bone levels and we can then colorize red and green. And you can imagine as a patient that your bone levels that are in red are ones that we'd want to treat now. And the ones in green will watch and make sure that they don't turn worse. And, and so we're, we're able to actually now visualize, and these are AI predictions on black and white images to communicate with patients. You have, you know, in yellow, you have a big cavity, you have a smaller cavity here and, and red is enamel. And when, you know, a cavity goes through enamel, this is when you should treat it. And, and we can monitor to see if it's gotten better or worse over time. And, and this is the, the, the power and strength of applying this computer vision technology uh, to a lot of the dental data that we have. You know, for those of you who unfortunately had a root canal, we are looking for, you know, abscesses and then the quality of the root canal over time. And then obviously looking at different types of radiographs for the dentist on the call, where we're not just looking at bite wings or PAs, but we're looking at panoramics and CBCTs. Uh, we're looking at intraoral imagery. We're looking, reading chart notes. And what we're doing is we're taking all of those data sources that we have available to us in the practice setting, in the academic setting, even in the insurance setting at times, and combining those uh, to help make a, a decision. So I'm going to go back to that first radiograph and, and just very, uh, you know, uh, quickly walk you through as you were the patient. You're the patient here, and I'm speaking to you that you have, you know, you need a deep cleaning because you have some bone loss. And I'm not only using this image, of course, I'm using the patient and medical history and, and a lot of other data, but just radiographically for uh, um, uh, argument's sake here, you know, there's a lot of things going on here. And if you're able to leverage those AI models that I had just uh, walk through on the slides previously, you can imagine now when I start talking about bone levels and you can see those measurements and different colors and tartar and orange boxes and decay in different colors because not all decay is equal. Some decay can be treated in, you know, invasively, some can be treated non-invasively and therapeutically depending on a number of factors. And so applying AI visualizations, you can imagine can help on a number of fronts uh, with standardization amongst clinicians, um, education for students, and especially empowerment for patients. The impact to the dental ecosystem, and obviously this is all about the LHA system today, but you know, when we're when we're actually looking at all that data from the practice management system, from the imaging software, from the medical history, we can combine that and obviously process that through our cloud-based platform and bring it into a single place so that it's there in near real time for, for patient use and, uh, and provider use. We can do research, right? We can track things over time quantitatively and at scale. We're not just talking about one, two, 10 cases because it takes a long time to collect that data and measure that data. We can look at thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. This is some research that we're also doing um, uh, with Harvard um, and have been doing so for the last uh, little while to look at, you know, progression of disease with well-controlled or non-well-controlled diabetes and really, again, putting that head back on the patient uh, for those of you who were uh, part of the, the keynote speak uh, um, uh, discussion. And lastly, again, using it in other areas. So, you know, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, you know, we want this to impact the patient on a number of fronts. The patient simply doesn't live in the dental practice. Their claim, you know, or their, 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 um, Procedure has a life cycle, and though you know there's there's an insurance submission component to that, so the ability to actually bring the payer and the provider and the patient sort of into the same room through this type of technology, where we can actually help um, you know um, improve the speed that 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 um, uh, benefits are paid uh, is a huge um, aspect and a whole hour discussion. But I just wanted everyone on the call to understand that. This is being used on multiple verticals. Now, how do we actually create more, uh, less silos and, and, and more integration between those, those vertical silos? And for students, and, and you know, it's, it's a training partner. It's a tool. It's like using loops if you're a doctor to see better or using a microscope if you're a scientist. AI is here to make you better and, and, and make you 
better at the things that you're already really good at, right? We are all trained as clinicians to, to be diagnosticians, to be surgeons, uh, to be, you know, community or, or, or hopefully be a good communicators. And if we can leverage a tool like this to help with that um, and, and a patient gets healthier as a result, or we're able to have an impact earlier than later, that's a, you know, that's a, it's a game changer and a paradigm shift in, uh, in, in the dental field. And the ADA, I just want to mention here, has recognized the importance of this and just published a white paper last week. For those of you who aren't, um, if you are ADA members, you can find this on their website. But um, this overview on artificial and augmented intelligence is a great white paper and summary about a, a lot of things on, on AI. And, and, and it's nice to see that, that you know, our uh, sort of advocating uh, organization is getting behind this as uh, in the dental community. And then lastly, just impacting patient understanding awareness in case of acceptance in two minutes, and then we'll, uh, I know we still have time for questions, um, is, you know, in real time, right, you come in, you have your radiograph taken, you're either a student in a dental school, you're learning in a classroom, you're a patient in a chair, you're a doctor in your operatory, uh, you're a clinical reviewer in an in, in insurance claims um, uh, office. This image comes in, the AI is run on it, and then it's brought into a single place and a single portal for you to interact with that information and, and be able to leverage that uh, the power of AI, uh, you know, at, at a couple, uh, you know, at your fin fingertips in, in some sense in this interactive portal where all data is being brought in from the PMS, from the radiograph, from the medical history, from the claims history, and everything can come into this single point of contact sort of source of truth, if you will. And this is what it looks like. And this is a, you know, a real-time video of how it's being leveraged by a clinician who's identifying and using AI to help a patient understand what do all these different shadows and data points mean? And we can colorize and visualize. Uh, we're going from you know, uh, black and white television in some sense to, to a, a world of, of, of color and transparency and consistency and accuracy uh, and allowing that patient to leave the operatory knowing more about their oral health than when they entered. And that's my goal as a clinician. I think that's all of our goals as, as providers, uh, irrespective of the setting that we practice in. Um, and, you know, a couple of closing remarks is, is just some questions about, you know, if AI could help us measure clinically relevant findings, would we want that? If, they, if it could allow us to communicate better, more effectively, would we, would, we want, would we welcome that? If it could help improve the speed at which students in particular could learn, would we want to leverage that? If we can measure outcomes of treatment over time, right? Like data to um, to performance, performance to um, uh, or, or data to knowledge, knowledge to performance. If we can if we can complete that um, that cycle uh, and then ultimately measure uh, that data to you know improve performance moving forward, uh, AI can help with that. And, and if we can prove that uh, with with a technology like this, would we want to incorporate that into our in our into our systems? if it can help us become better diagnosticians, and lastly, if it can help augment our clinical abilities, can it make us better at what we already do well? Can it allow us to see better than we already do? Would we, would we embrace that? Um, and, you know, our answer is we believe so, and that's, you know, our mission, and uh, we're on a, uh, on a path to, to improve uh, oral health care through artificial intelligence for hopefully uh, an industry and, 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 and beyond, you know, my lifetime of clinical practice. So I just want to say thank you so much. If you have any questions, you can take a screen grab of that uh, code there, and that'll take you to my, um, I think, uh, my LinkedIn, or it'll, it'll send you my information, or you can email me uh, at chris at overjet.ai if you want to learn more about AI and dental medicine. Um, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to speak to everyone. Thank you for uh, attending in, a, in the middle of a busy work week to everyone here. Chris, you have uh, one question in the chat box. Sure. Uh, from Sujan Samanta, what kind of prediction or simulation models can AI help with when it comes to dental care of troubled teeth in the process? What type of data sets are utilized? Um, happy to have an open, more open discussion. I want to make sure I'm understanding the, 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 the question correctly, but could we technically use AI and predictive analytics to say, if you don't do something, here's what may happen over time. Is that what, um, is being asked there? Yeah. Um, the answer is 
this technology is very good at that. You need a lot of data over a long period of time in order to um, to make those predictive analytics with uh, you know some accuracy. And there's a lot of other factors that come into play. So uh, you know medical history, home care, oral hygiene. Um, other factors that come into that to play. So if we have that data, which again, we do have a, a lot of that data, uh, a lot of the times it's not very well organized or, or documented exactly in the in the sense that we want. But the answer is we would we would the answer is yes, we can do that. Uh, right now, we are leveraging that type of um, um, sort of experiment, if you will, uh, but more retrospectively. Right. Um, so where we're actually um, looking and saying how much has something changed over time as opposed to how much will this change given a number of other factors if you don't do anything about it or, or if you don't change a behavior or habit we haven't gone into predicting the future yet but we are saying that you know for example you had a cavity or you had bone loss and it changed by x percentage or it's gotten this much worse or this much better or it's stabilized over time um that's the the aspect that we're we're capturing right now at least us personally uh, i can't speak for others i think what you're speaking about here is 100 percent um you know, will occur. I think we need a lot more of that that re retrospective data and analyzed correctly in order to be able to make those those future predictions. I hope that helps answer your question. I see Dr. Donoff is on the call on uh, on camera there, and it's been uh, thank you so much for joining. It's uh, it's been a while since I've I've seen you. Uh, I want to give credit where it's due, but Dr. Donoff had a big part of uh, Overjet uh, sort of trampolining in uh, in the early days. So thank you so much, and it's very nice to see you. I hope uh, I hope retirement is treating you well. You're you're on mute there, but I've I've gotten way better at reading lips since uh, we've we've lived in this digital world. I was on the other webinars, but I thought I'd try and catch it. <laughs> I'm fine. Glad to see you doing well. You too, Doc. Thank you. Is the model used primarily for a diagnostic tool, or can it be trained for projected treatment options? Uh, the answer is again at the moment, and if you hear otherwise uh, from any other, call it dental AI. Um, organization out there that we are diagnosing. The answer is we are not diagnosing. We are a clinician decision support tool. And that is what we are cleared for at the moment. And there are semantics that I've learned about through the FDA process, but we're here to support decisions that clinicians are making um, and not make them for them. And I'm going to put a bunch of caveats there because I think the answer is yet. Yeah. And I think that this will become a CADEX type of diagnostic device at some point. Right now, these are all sort of under these CAD E umbrellas of clinician uh, decision support. Uh, with respect to saying you should do this or you should do that from a projected treatment, um, there are there are um, recommendations to say you know with all the data given, this may be a potential candidate for this. But in no way is is the technology and at least ours position to say you should do this right now. I do believe in the very near future, though, we will, especially when you start to incorporate CBCT data, medical data, if we can get that integration together, uh, where you could have, you know, a treatment plan outlined by AI, and it could be more than one, right? And there is more than one way of treating, uh, uh, you know, the same person. You saw that there were 75 ways of treating the same person. I'm not saying they're all right, but the AI could say, you know, based on the 100 million data points that we've looked at, this would most likely be the best treatment option for this patient and really moving towards that, like, you know, I don't want to use the word concierge medicine. The word that I want is, is not coming to my mind, but it's not a one size fits all. And I'm hoping that AI can help with that to say, based on all of these factors that we've taken in that from the data points that we have, you would most likely benefit from X, Y, and Z versus, you know, Dr. Wen may, 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 we may have the same condition dentally, but other things, you know, that, that play into that decision um, may change the recommendation. Um, and then how we monitor their monitor that afterwards, um, I believe, you know, We'll get there. These are aspirational, but I think that the, the answer is yes. And it's not going to be, you know, 10 years from now. I think we're going to see this much sooner than that. So I, I have a question. Oh, yeah, go go ahead. Uh, no, no, I, that's fine. I just want to make a comment. That is actually making the data science is more important than ever. And this is also, you know, su suggesting that we're talking about ecosystem. We need to have the right ecosystem, which is really helping not only have the technology, but also supporting the regulatory approval 
And uh, while this is not excluding the professional judgment of the dentist, but those big, those big data is definitely going to help you to standardize the dentistry. Alex, I'll back to you. Yeah, so first of all, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Balabai and Dr. Chi for being speakers. I was in the other, my own uh, uh, session. But I have a question for the two of you. And uh, you are leading in many ways uh, entrepreneurship and research on, in adding that into uh, the dental field. Uh, you saw the lecture today by Dr. Tabak that data sharing is very important and across several sh uh, shareholders. So it means not only research, but also companies, insurance. That was one of the questions from Dr. Xi. So what is your perspective? How that new policies or data sharing uh, ideas from the government, uh, it's also, uh, what is your perspective in that sense? Well, Dr. Xi, you wanna, you wanna start with that one? I, ha I have sure. some. So I, the, the reason I think this is critical, that's why I was asking that question, because it was a, very interesting, I attended this uh, uh, data conference at MIT and one graduate student asked the right question. They say, you know, building algorithm and all that is easy for us. I can know how to process in the data, but where is the data for me to play with? And uh, I know NIH would try to do something like all of us, but the data was very lousy and uh, uh, some of the, the best ones, like I said, the insurance company had, you know, just like, a, you know, uh, Delta Dental Michigan, their data center was amazing. And, uh, and also, I also know it was uh, all the uh, x-ray ever, I think in the last 40 or 50 years, was all goes to a warehouse of the herring shine and before I actually send it to the different insurance company. So if any of those data, could be figure out a way to be shared. This is going to be the true revolution for our dentistry. So um, I don't have the exact answer, but I think we know where the data is. We just needed to coordinate, you know, as uh, as part of the stakeholder to promoting it. It's very interesting when you're talking to the Henry Shine. They would love to make the data useful as well, and. Uh, um, we'll just figure out a way, yeah. Uh, but Chris, go ahead. I just wanted to add, um, Dr. De Silva, the, the answer is, I think we also have to start with, there has to be a standardization of, of what that data looks like, right? Because we've worked through many pilots, either with, you know, an insurance company or with a school, and all of a sudden, you know, we have all this data, but, you know, we want it in DICOM, you're sending it in PNG format for images, for example. So we first have to have a standard, which I know the ADA is trying to, you know, was trying to help with, and, and I'm not sure, you know, how much success, and that thing takes a long time, right? So first we need to say, if you are going to store data, it needs to be in X, Y, and Z format or certain formats so that when we query it, that we can actually leverage it without having to work through all of these IT transformations. So once that's done, if that ever gets done, then I think we can start to say, you know, we can share across institutions, organizations, um, the other aspect of that is I think that Dr. Tabak made a great point. People want to monetize this data and, you know, young and growing companies like ours, if it wasn't for the support that we got from the MITs and Harvards of the world, we couldn't afford to buy that. Right. And, and again, maybe not, it's not even for sale yet in some sense, but, you know, I think uh, uh, the commercialization of that data is, you know, versus the democratization of that data is a, is a whole different discussion for uh, maybe another a meeting. Um, but right now, it is not easy to share data across anything. You can't even share data across a dental practice. If you have Dentrix in one and Dentrix in the other, it's very, it's challenging to do now unless you adopt, okay, a cloud solution. But, you know, there's a, it's a loaded question, but I think it's a very good one. And I hope that the end, I hope it gets solved sooner than later so that we could tap into it as well. Yes, and, and make it even a sustainable, whatever yeah. the dynamic in the ecosystem and uh, you play. So I, uh, I'm trying here just to, first of all, again, uh, thank the presence of all of you and also uh, your presentations and discussions. I, I, the questions were amazing. And uh, from the beginning to the end, 
and I hope that we all be part of the next event and uh, and we can really work because we, we definitely need a lot of work in this field. Um, it's not only a dream. I mean, we need really to uh, uh, focus and uh, uh, educate people and educate ourselves. So with that, I thank you and I uh, uh, we will uh, think about on the next event. Thank you very much, you all. Yeah, Alex, I want to take the opportunity to thank you for your leadership. You know, this is just an amazing event. I truly enjoyed and learned a lot. And uh, I think it's just so right to getting those different stakeholders together and uh, to, to, to get this going. And uh, if I may just say a one last word here, since we're talking about the ecosystem, the concluding remark I wanted to mention is uh, this is a good timing, you know, 15 years ago, when I tried to start my startup, you know, when we raised $200 million, it was a miracle. But today, and uh, you see that story all over the place. And I think what Chris has already showed, uh, four young, fresh graduates, you know, be able to raise $80 million and then now, runs a high 150 people company and to try to, you know, disrupting the, the dentistry. And there are many of those stories now those days. And uh, so I think for all the audience, especially the young dentists, you know, I highly encourage you to look into the entrepreneurship and explore, you know, what, what this new world is, is be able to offer. Definitely, because I really want this breakout session because in entrepreneurship, there where we see a lot of innovation. Uh, and, and that's what we need to see uh, that perspective and opportunity right now of technologies, of companies and startup like Dr. Balaban, your work, Dr. Sheer, like it helping so many in our field to put this, because the other thing about entrepreneurship is the scale up, I mean, to more uh, users or, you know, uh, use this knowledge, not only for conference, but actually the daily activities that you have. So that's in practice of dentistry and uh, 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 the medical field. So this is what's important. You scale up this and reach more people, the innovations that we have. So thank you for all your work on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Have a wonderful day.